This presentation is called The Controversial Edward O. Wilson, Part 2. This controversy derives from Wilson's enthusiasm for two concepts. One, the concept of the superorganism, and two, the concept of eusociality. And an excellent source to read more about this is Wilson's book, The Superorganism. And in it, he pursues the question, what explains the success of insect societies relative to other living things? And his answer is their eusocial organization. So then we have to ask, well, what is eusociality? And Wilson points to three features. So this concept was actually developed back in the 1920s, and it's been defined in various ways. But as Wilson views it, there are three essential features of eusocial organisms. And the first is a division of labor between subsistence producers and reproductives. So only some members of the colony get to reproduce. The second feature is that there have to be multiple generations alive in the colony at the same time, a minimum of two generations. And the third is the practice of cooperative breeding. And this entails that the non-reproductive producers help care for the offspring of the reproductives. So that's what a youth social organism is. Uh, what's a superorganism? Well, this concept is also an old concept. And Wilson defines it as a youth social society that functions as a single organism. And this means that selection acts on the entire society rather than on individual members of it. So youth social organisms are the product of group selection, and that's a constant theme in his book, The Superorganism. He draws a series of analogies between what we typically think of as being an organism and the superorganism. For example, he argues that in an organism, we speak of it being made up of cells Analogous to this in a superorganism are the colony members who function as if they were cells in a single organism. Similarly, in an organism, those cells are organized into organs, and just so the colony members are organized into caste. There's a distinction in sexually reproducing organisms between the sex cells and the somatic cells, so we talk about the sex cells as being gametes, and analogous to that in the superorganism are the reproductive caste. Most of the cells in an organism are not sex cells, but rather somatic cells, and analogous to those in the superorganism then are the sterile workers who don't reproduce. And he makes many more uh, similar arguments that we can find in the superorganism all the principles of a single living organism and that they're selected as one unit. This has given rise then to what we're going to call the group selection controversy. And obviously this has been going on since the 1960s when the Neo-Darwinians first criticized group selection but it's been greatly revived through the work of Edward O. Wilson because he argues that group selection is key to understanding the rise of eusocial ant societies, but also to understanding the rise of human societies. And the most accessible source of this argument is his recent book, The Social Conquest of Earth, when we open this book and look for the key principles of social life, we find that reciprocity is hardly discussed at all. So it's been uh, removed from the analysis. But what has produced the greatest controversy uh, 
is that Wilson is very critical of Hamilton's rule and inclusive fitness. He argues that inclusive fitness theory is both mathematically and biologically incorrect. So our question is, well, what could be wrong with inclusive fitness? And according to Wilson, at a theoretical level, the problem is that there's no agreed definition of R. Now we use just one definition of R in this class, and that's based on a pedigree and the likelihood of a gene being identical by descent. But R has also been defined in various other ways. But most important to Wilson are the empirical problems. And he argues that as evidence has accumulated, there's no fit between high levels of relatedness and eusociality, that it sometimes fails to evolve in species that have very high levels of relatedness, and it's also emerged in species that have relatively low levels of relatedness. And most strikingly, it seems to explain little about variation in social organization among the ants, termites, bees, and wasps. These species are known as the Hymenoptera, and in Hamilton's work, they were the initial example of kin selection and inclusive fitness because many of the Hymenoptera have especially high levels of relatedness. But as further evidence came in, it became clear that high levels of relatedness could not explain why some of those societies are so profoundly eusocial. And so if inclusive fitness can't explain eusociality, what can? And Wilson's answer is that we can jettison inclusive fitness altogether and go back to two arguments. First, we simply look at individual selection, and by this he means plain old direct fitness, and this applies to the reproductives in the colonies. So this means our reproductive fitness measured in terms of our own offspring rather than in terms of those of our relatives. And then to this, he argues we should add group selection. And by this, he means genetically based biological group selection. And in Wilson's view, if we put plain old individual selection together with group selection, we have everything we need adding in ecological parameters to explain how eusocial societies evolved. Now, an interesting aspect of his argument is that individual selection and group selection are frequently countervailing forces. So he argues that individual selection gives rise to selfishness, selfish individuals, whereas group selection gives rise to selflessness and sacrifice for the sake of the group as a whole. And more strikingly, he argues that this applies to humans as well as to insect societies, and humans have also been produced through a combination of individual selection for selfish individuals and group selection for selflessness. So he speaks of an iron rule of social evolution. And his iron rule is that in genetic social evolution, selfish individuals will beat altruistic individuals, while groups of altruists will beat groups of selfish individuals. When we're looking at competition among individuals within groups, selfishness wins out. Whereas when we're looking at different groups, altruists win. And let's try to illustrate this. So for selection between groups, let's imagine that we have on the one hand, a group where everybody plays the strategy of always defect. And we've defined this earlier this semester when we were discussing reciprocity and Robert Axelrod's work. And on the other hand, let's say that we have a group of cooperators playing all C. 
So the defectors always selfishly defect on one another, and the cooperators always sacrifice altruistically for one another. And Wilson's argument is that the group of altruists will always outperform the group of defectors. So at the level of group selection, the altruists win. But when we turn to selection among individuals within groups, then things change. And in this case, we'll find that individual defectors will outperform individual altruists when they meet one another. And you can look back at the discussions of the prisoner's dilemma and Axelrod for more details on this. But let's imagine that one of these defectors comes across and joins the group of cooperators. As we showed earlier, that defector will rapidly begin to outcompete and replace those individual cooperators. So what has to happen for both processes to continue is that groups of cooperators have to be much more successful than groups of defectors. But at the same time, we know that if individual defectors get into those groups of cooperators, they're going to prevail. So a question might be, well, which of these strategies wins out in human and insect evolution? And Wilson argues that neither wins, but rather each wins in its own way. And the result of this is that our genetic fitness is a product of both processes. So as individuals were selected to be selfish within groups, but were at the same time selected to be selfless to our groups, and this gives rise to our ambivalent human nature. So within group selection, times between group selection, with both of these forces acting to produce human nature, we get our fundamental contradictory ethical systems and our fundamentally contradictory morals we have the little devil sitting on one shoulder, as it were, and the angel on the other. And this is because of our evolutionary history. It produces selfish altruists. And indeed, we do seem capable of befuddling ourselves in the speed with which we can turn from being generous to selfish and back again. So Wilson argues that there is an inherent an irremedial conflict in human societies between the product of natural selection at the individual level and the product of natural selection at the group level. Now, if we think about this, uh, what are our prospects for the future? Well, we know that we live in a global society that's a seven billion human entity and we know that we're facing a massive biodiversity crisis, or scientists agree that we are, and we can pose the question, should we expect cooperation to be forthcoming? And if not, what would prevent it? Well, Wilson would say our selfish individuality might prevent it. And on the other hand, our group loyalties might help but this is only if we can define the group in the proper manner. So in order to achieve cooperation at a global level, we would have to view all living humans as belonging to our group. Now there's a prior issue here as we're trying to apply these concepts to problems like biodiversity, and that's whether Wilson has actually got it right. So many other biologists argue that he's taken a wrong turn with this. And particularly when it comes to human societies, we have to ask, are human societies plausible products of group selection? And that's what we're going to approach next. So it does appear that there are certain analogies between contemporary human societies and the societies of ants and bees. So one thing is that we seem to see traffic jams in both of these societies.
We looked very crowded and poured together, whether we're looking at a column of ants or a column of human cars. But is it the case uh, that group selection can explain anything about us? Thank you for listening.